Great. So the next thing I want to talk about builds on the last part uh, with the animation, and that's to talk about animation uh, along a path. And this is useful for a couple of reasons. One, sometimes it's just useful to, you know, have something uh, travel along a path. We, we did this a lot in um, Grasshopper, right? When we would take a curve and we would do, you know, we would find points along the curve and then we, we, we would distribute our geometry along the curve, right? And uh, so this is a way to do that in, in um, Max, but without, you know, Grasshopper. So I'm just gonna take a primitive, um, let's take teapots, because we're awesome. Okay. Make some teapots here. I lost my grid, okay, take a teapot. Ooh, and a blue teapot, okay. And to do this, what you do is, you take the geometry that you want to distribute, and you go into the motion uh, panel. And guys, remember I told you that animation is really complicated? This is where it can get really complicated. These are all kinds of motion controllers, rotation controllers. What the computer is doing is it's trying to like solve a lot of like calculus-based problems, right? You guys know in calculus where you're like taking a curve and you're trying to cut up sections of the curve to find out where something is along a curve? There's lots of ways to do that, and some of them are more intensive than others. This whole panel is, is basically about those kinds of ideas. It's like, how do you interpolate from one state of something to another? Some of that is controlled by the motion uh, tabs. I take my object, I'm going to assign a controller to it, and uh, I'm going to pick, pick this uh, option here for transform, click on this little book here. Actually, I did the wrong one. I'm going to do position, sorry. Um, and I'm going to say path constraint. And now I have constrained my teapot uh, to a path, but which path? I say add path and I click on the curve I made. And now I've got something that flows along a curve at a pretty relative you know, speed. Note that it doesn't like turn, it's just kind of following it, okay? And if I change the keys, it's gonna get there faster, right? If it gets there by 50, it means it's gonna get there faster. If we move to 100, it's going to get there slower. That'll make that'll be important in a moment here. But what we can do with that, though, is if you combine that idea with the snapshot tool, you can get different uh, patterns of things. Uh, so I go to snapshot, and I can say I want a range, I want 10 copies. This is the same thing as, as last time. So I get I get it basically equally spaced like 10 things along a path. Okay. Okay. So that's that's okay. Like that's. That does something, but that's not any better than a uh, grasshopper. Okay. Let me show you a couple different things. You can uncheck the thing for constant velocity, and then the curvature actually, you know, you guys know from physics, you guys know physics really well. When you're uh, turning a corner, you have to accelerate in two directions, right? Like you're, you're going forward, but then you're also going a little bit left or a little bit right, and every time you go a little bit more in one direction than another, what that does though, it, Okay, so you guys have been on go-karts before, right? Do you like leave the accelerator down the entire time even as you make turns or do you like ease up on the turns a little bit? Even if you don't, right, when you're making those turns, you're slowing down like a bit because your momentum is being converted from forward momentum to angular momentum. You slow down, basically. So what happens is, is that when you do this, you actually see a change in speed as it, as it makes a, a turn as opposed to on a straightaway. If you check constant velocity, it just ignores that. Okay, so if I don't have constant velocity checked and I make my snapshot, I should see a difference. Yeah, not so much. The, the, more, the more frames you get though, you should see them getting closer together as the curve would get tighter. Okay, so that's actually an interesting way to diagram something. You can actually show curvature as the distance between like objects. Okay, not super sexy. Yeah, oh yeah, well, camera following a path is the same idea. You can put a camera, yeah, let's, I mean, we can go ahead and do that. Um, if I put a box here, and we go in and make my camera object, and now the camera is different than the target, right? The, the target's what's aimed at, the camera is the camera. And right now the camera's here. I'm gonna pan up so that I get a good view of my box here, and all that's boxy, majestic glory. Um, there we go, okay. So I got my camera. I can put the camera uh, on the path. So 
So if I go in and I got my camera, I'm going to go into motion, go to position, path, constraint, I'm going to add that path. And so now it's, it's going to go along that path. And if I go to my camera view, and if you hit play, we actually haven't done this before, we've been scrubbing it back and forth. If you hit play, it's going to play it. And so that's actually how you get you know, a camera path. You could control the target separately, so the target's going to go up and down, then your head's going to look up and down as you go. But basically, guys, like, yeah, that's how you do a, like a camera animation. I wasn't going to talk about it. I, didn't, I don't really do a lot of animations. I think they're really time consuming. I'd rather like diagram something or give you a lot of like vignettes than actually animate stuff. But yeah, if you want to know how to do it, that's how you do it. Now, we only have 100 frames, right? That's kind of lame. Like 100 frames at 30 frames per second is like three and a third seconds. Lame. You can go in if you want to uh, and change the uh, time scale. I um, can't remember the, uh, pardon me here. It used to be a little. I think it's that button next to it. Go to the right. This thing. There you go. The time time configuration. Thank you. I knew it was an icon there. You can go in and you can say like, okay, now it's a thousand frames. And then you could say rescale time. I like kind of screwed it up there. Um, if I go in, and I don't want to re redo all the keys, I can do a thousand frames rescale time. And now the keys should be distributed. Well, yeah, doesn't look like they are. But anyway, if I move it. Now it's going to take me 30 seconds. So you much more leisurely pace around that box there. Okay. So increasing the number of frames, that's also useful for your snapshots, right? Like the limit of that snapshot technique is the number of frames you have, right? What if I want a thousand things? I need more like frames. I need more info. Okay. So changing the time scale is useful. Should have done teapot. Would have been much more dramatic. But that. That's your thing, and you know, again, you could go in, and I could edit the, uh, the, uh, I could keyframe the target, so that like I go in, and I'm gonna move the key, you know, I'm gonna move this down, and then so that way it actually is gonna change as I go. So now my view is gonna pan down the building as I as I animate. So you can see like the horizon line changing. Okay. So there you go. So the same technique applies. But I, I'm interested in like the kind of formal kind of properties of motion. Okay. All right. So I made this line. I'm going to do a couple other things to it to make it more interesting. Lines uh, can be three dimensional. So if I go in. I made a NURBS line because I want it to follow the point. So if I move a point in space, it actually like deforms it three-dimensionally. You don't get that with splines, right? They're just going to be all fast and weird. That's pretty interesting. A little roller coaster action there. See? So check this out. If I take... Let's just do a, let's do a box for right now. You never get too many boxes. And I want to make it. I want to make it simple, though. Okay, little box. Let's shade it. Okay. Okay. So, and I want to do do a rectangle also. Boring rectangle. Let's do the rectangle first. So I got a motion. You guys should like. You know, we should have this down by now. You go into motion. Go to that assign controller uh, button for position. Oops. Assign a path to it. Uh, add the path to it. Okay. And so now it's on the path and like, oh, that's that's super lame. But check this out. If we go follow path, we can change the axes of it so that it actually is extruded along the path, basically. Right? Whoa. It's like, damn, it's a roller coaster. And that can get interesting when we apply things like snapshot. Okay? Because it's actually flowing along that like surface. Okay. So could you tell the camera to follow the path? 
Well, you could do that too. Yeah, you could have it follow a three-dimensional path. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah. But oh yeah, you could. But I mean, I don't know why you'd really because the camera's giving you a, a, like a rendering every at every position anyway. There's no reason unless you just want a lot of cameras for some reason. Well, you could well yeah, but then just take every fifth frame of the animation or something like that. Yeah. Sorry, man. It rained on your parade. No, Trevor. So can you sweep that? Yeah, you can sweep that. So this is actually an interesting thing. So like, I can animate this because think about animation as a generative tool. Don't think about it as like animation. So I go and I'm halfway home. If I if I scale the size of it, then I've created. It's actually going to change size as it moves along the path. And I can go in and I can keyframe something else here. I can make it tiny. And then it's going to get big again. OK, turn off my auto key. And then I can go through and I can say uh, snapshot. And I want you know, it's just 100 copies or something like that, just to be. So you can start to get, start to translate that into some, into some forms. Okay. I could go in to actually literally make that a, you can do lofts in um, Max, but they're not like smooth lofts like you get in Rhino. They're just interpolations from one cross section to another, um, but, they're, but they're polygons. But let's do that. So I go in to snapshot. I don't want mesh, I want copy. Mesh is going to create the um, polygon when I just want a curve. Let's just, then let's just do like, let's just do 12 just for now and see what we get here. So I've got these shapes here. And then if I go in and I do a compound object, lofts are under compound objects. Pick the cross section loft. And I want to say, you know, get shape. And I could keep. Uh, it came over. Oh. Uh, let's see here. Now, it's gonna look, it gets a little wonky, but you, you go a certain uh, distance along the shape and then you can add each of these sections to it let's see if this does it I don't use this very often but and it may be one of these things where eh. yeah that's not helping um, but you you can do it it's just a little oh geez it's just a little crashy um, but a loft object is a compound object that consists of the cross section, I mean, of the spline and the cross sections. And so if you have the cross sections and the spline, you get a loft. The trouble with it is, though, is that it's not animated, it's not tied to the animated stuff anymore. What's cool about that that I didn't show you guys because it crashed, and you can imagine this, though, is it's parametric. If I change the path, if I move those points around, everything gets redistributed. So the animation, the the uh, keying of the shape moving along the path and its size is dependent upon the size of and the position of the path. So if I change the path, I get a new, new, newly configured shape. And that's what always bothers me about Rhino, right? Is that you can't like manipulate stuff after you've created it. Really, it's stuck, like it's burned. You know, right? Let me just quick, just to prove a point, because again, I think if I show you, it, it's more valuable. Let me just quick. Uh, do what I just did there, and then we'll then we'll do something else. Make a little box again. Motion controller path. That path. Uh, follow. There you go. Okay, so I've got this thing, and you know that's really nice. But I can always go in to the uh, path and edit it. And you can see, actually, check this out. I'm actually moving that, that do you see that it's blue? Kind of hard to see. Let's, let's do something with that. You can always change the color of stuff by clicking on the little icon in the corner there, and then you can, there we go. Easier to see. Okay, so if I move the path, it's gonna move that thing parametrically. That's kind of cool. Okay. So, um, moving objects along a path, transforming them along the path, like creating snapshots of them, right, is another way to generate form. The path could be something that you're trying to diagram that's like happening on your site. 
and the object is some kind of cross section that you derived, or or, or or like Lynn, maybe it's just a stand in for something like a person or something like that, right? So it's a way to like quickly kind of span those kind of diagrams. You can also use it as a form of morphing as the keyframes like transform that object. Okay, any questions about uh, objects on a, on a path? Okay, do you guys want to practice that for a minute or do you want to move on? Who wants to practice? Hands up, someone wants to practice back here. Okay, let's practice for a minute. I'll come around if you guys have questions or something like that. Experiment though, like try something interesting. You know, some forms can be made constraints you don't get too out of plane with that.
Well, you gotta, you gotta be at that time. Okay, scrub at that time, turn on the automatic keys, and then rotate. Oh, I see you on that. And that should turn it off, but you should turn it. Yeah, that's Also, you need to key the rotation. Well, I guess it is keeping zero, but it's just going to be that Rotation gets really, oh my gosh, you put a fan thing on the fan. On the fan. Very cool. Oh, there's one inside of it, too? On that one. Okay, so check out, okay, so check out like Dakota's uh, piece here. He has an object going along on a path that has an object going along on a path that has an object going along on a path. If you snapshotted it, you would get a 3D kind of spider graph thing. You get enough, you get enough of those things, right? It's like a planet orbiting a planet orbiting a planet. What is snapshot? Tools snapshot. Well, did you get it? Did you get it? That's not expected for the little star. If you have more, if you do like a thousand frames, you don't have enough information. But it's pretty cool. Yeah, you just don't, you can only get like a hundred uh, snaps out of it, so it's not going to be enough. Uh, no well, why don't you just do a little time in the same And then you pull your keys, like keep your objects and you pull the keys uh, all the way to the thousand because you're just going to start. Can you add modifiers to a specific thing? Uh, you can add a minor, modifier to the object, and then when you get to a key, you just make the modification. So you have no mod, and then you increase the level of the mod. Uh, you can delete the mod after that. Like, no, you never, you can't. No, it's like, um, I'm trying to find an analogy for it. Like, if you're going to take it with you, you have to have it, you have to start with it. You can't just add and delete modifiers because there's no information in the system. You can have a modifier, let's say, for bend, but there's no bend in it, right? And then you get to 50 and you bend it, and then when you're done, you have no bend. You like turn it off. Yeah, but so essentially it has, no, I mean, you don't turn it off. You never turn it off, it just has no bend. Like, off would be zero bend. Yeah, that makes sense. Can you make it that? Yeah, totally good. So you just have to re it to the real? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, that was kind of, I mean, I can put the example together. No, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's, you know, guys, we just uh, when we started this like an hour ago, like, you're going to, a little bit of adjustment. But again, I think there are forms that you can create through like the motion of something. Uh, that can be relevant to the things that we're trying to visualize, that we're trying to study, that we're trying to make. You know, there's nothing wrong with form, right? Oh my God, that's awesome. Um, if you go into the uh, tool, go into the motion uh, piece, if, if you have the object selected that you're modeling, uh, go into the path control, so go to position, open that path control. Like a big, big part of this is that you're not sure what you're going to get, and there's not as much of a penalty for trying as there is with you know tools like Rhino. Frankly, like I, I feel like you do a lot of precision stuff in that program, but it doesn't really want to let you, uh, you know, play. And if there's anything that I think we can get out of this is to inject more play into the kinds of uh, forms we create.
In fact, um, that's how they animate a lot of things. They, they just draw like, where the ball starts, where it hits, and like, where, where it's supposed to end up, and they love it like three or four times backwards. The old, the old style animations, you guys know this, you used to take you know, a piece of paper and you draw every frame and you do it. Like nowadays, when you watch any cartoons like SpongeBob and like whatever, they're mostly interplay. Like they draw every three frames, every ten frames, and the computer actually it. They draw a lot less than they used to because they use the computer. Like the Simpsons slide is all. That's how they can crank out shows uh, that fast. Uh, South Park is famously like that. Because all their stuff is already saved as a clip art, and if they're moving stand from like one side to the other, that's what this thing, that's what it does. And in fact, they use Maya to animate it, which is just like a cousin of Studio Max. There you go, quick job, quick day job, go become an animator. Oh, that's cool. Like a trumpet. Well, is it two chords? No, it's just a one. Oh, you applied a modifier to it. Oh, man. Plug that in. Can you get that up there? Check out Barkus. He's going to put it up on the monitor here. I wish I could, like, get into your machines remotely. That'd be awesome. If I could show what you're doing. I used to have a lab that did that. It's coming up. Oh, do you need to... Uh, there it is. So check that out. Can, can you kind of zoom us around there? So it's a modifier that's applied to what, like a ring? Uh, torus. Oh, torus. Okay, torus is like a fancy donut, right? It's a bend modifier. Sweet. It's, so it's one object with a bend? Well, it's uh, the snapshot. Yeah, but I mean, that's what you did to generate it, though. Yeah. Okay, so along the path with a modifier. There you go. Pretty neat. Cool. Thanks, man. Okay, you guys ready to? What's that? Okay, click on the cube, and then the little wheel up in the right-hand corner, the tab. Yeah, you're on the right tab there. Click on uh, position, and then the little playbook. Yep, that thing, and then path control, path and screen. No, one up, one above. There you go. Then you get all your other stuff. Yeah, the interface is in whack. It's hard to. Uh, if you make something cool, stamp a copy of it for yourself. Put it on a key drive. Okay. Next thing I want to talk about is morphing. And again, morphing is one of these things that, like, hypercolor t shirts and I don't know what, like, went out of style from the 90s, right? Like, morphing used to be kind of a big deal. You guys remember Terminator 2? Who could forget, really? Uh, the Michael Jackson black or white video, like, where they morph into different people. So morphing is, like, this, uh, this idea that you change an object from one state to another, and you kind of see the in-betweens. Um, I'm going to show you an example uh, of that. Now, a lot of the stuff... Here's the, thing, here's the thing to understand about morphing, and you'll, you won't mess it up, is that if you think about it, if you want to transform one thing to another, like let's say we have this like box here, and we have this like sphere, okay? Uh, if I look at these things, how many like vertices does the box have, just by estimate? Yeah, how many vertices does the box have? Eight, right? Four on the top, four on the bottom. Click, you know, you put them all together, you get a box. Just, just by raw estimate, how many does the sphere have? What's that? Two hundred. I don't know. A lot more, right? Not, not eight, right? Okay. So, pretend you're a morphing algorithm, and a morph is essentially like, okay, I'm gonna say, take that box and make that into that like sphere. You can't do it, right? Because the box doesn't have enough like information. To move those, if you move those eight points around, you're gonna get the best you could do is maybe get a little, like, little, you know, like a diamond or something, not very sphere-like. But could you take the sphere and map it to the like box? That's a, that's an interesting question too. You probably could. You would just send like one eighth of the points to one corner and one eighth of the points to the other, and sha na na na. But I'll tell you what, it would probably look like crappy. Okay. 
But that's what morphing does. It looks at the vertices of the objects, looks for their location, and it attempts to tween them. So it's like you have one animation frame that's a sphere, and one animation frame that's a cube, and everything kind of shuffles from like one point to another. What we can deduce from this, and what means that morphing is actually uh, can be pretty tough, is that the optimal way to morph something is to start with the object and just modify it. Like if you have the same number of points in the first object and the same number of points in the last object, then the math is very easy. If you got two different things, though, all bets are off. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start by showing you the the method for just like morphing something. Uh, all morphs are a compound object, and you pretty much need uh, two versions of an object. So let's take an object, and I'm going to clone it, which is a fancy way of saying copy, and make a copy of it. And then I'm going to hide that copy. So I'm going to go, and I haven't shown you guys this, but you can say hide selection. And it's just like hide in uh, Rhino, it just disappears temporarily. Okay, so if you right click, you can say hide selection. Okay, so that one's gone. I'm going to take my uh, sphere. And I'm going to go to an edit mesh. And I'm going to, I had so much fun earlier with that uh, soft selection thing. I'm going to do some of that again. <clears throat> and I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to move this thing. I'm, I'm going to kind of squish it or something like that. And maybe, maybe move it a little bit too. Maybe rotate it. I don't know. The point is that all I'm doing is pulling the points around. Like, but I haven't created new points. I haven't like deleted uh, new points. Okay, I had this object, and I did something to it. I made like a finger or something like that. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my. I'm gonna unhide that other sphere, and rest assured, you know it's there. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with that sphere and I'm going to go to compound uh, object and make a morph and then I'm going to pick my morph target which is uh, this person here and that's going to give me you know and it gives me keyframes like depending on what frame I'm in when I when I add that target that gives me the keyframe so I can make a transformation over you know X number of frames and that's going to be slower now, I could always go in and modify that sphere again, make a copy of it, and I can have as many targets as I want. So I can have this thing doing all kinds of stuff before it ends up in its final form. Morphing is used for facial animation uh, more than anything, right? Or for character animation. If you have a guy raising his eyebrow, he doesn't get a new eyebrow. The eyebrow changes like position, or his nostrils like flare a bit, or his mouth opens. So by morphing from one target to another, your characters talk and they wink and their eyes open and like whatever. Morphing is, is pretty much extensively uh, used for that. Um, so anyway, uh, that's a that's a that's kind of a quick morph. The other th way that we can use a morph uh, that I like that's kind of architectural is to start with a box, and I'm going to add some like segments to it. And uh, once again, I'm going to go ahead and uh, clone it, <clears throat> hide the uh, evidence, and I'm going to go into Edit Mesh, and yeah, I can start like pushing and pulling points around. Uh, to create, you know, some interesting, hopefully, you know, form. Okay, so I've got this, got this form that I'm creating. Remkulas, you know, something like that. Okay, and uh, you know, facety. Good enough. And then I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna unhide that. Um, oops. Unhide my box, take my box, and make it a compound object. And again, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch where my frame is here. We go to frame 100, uh, go to morph, pick my target, which is this other box here, and then that's gonna let me morph that form from one form to another. Can you get snapshots of that? Oh yeah, that's where we're headed. So why don't we just do this for now? And then I'll show you how to get the entire sequence of images from one morph to the other, which is, yeah, you're on it. You got it, right? Okay. So just, I, I would, you know, do a box or, you know, anything you want. Now, a, um, 
applying a uh, modifier is, is effectively like a morph, right? Like if I apply bend or twist, it's the same thing, right? But the morph is interesting because we can we can insert like different forms, you know, in between other forms. And we can do things like just editing a mesh, which is actually really cool. I may be wrong about this, but I believe that if you edit a mesh between frames, I don't think it does anything. I think you actually have to use a morph modifier because otherwise it doesn't know how to tell one point to go to another point. You pretty much just altered the base mesh. Again, someone's going to comment on this video on YouTube and like decimate me, but I'm pretty sure that that's uh, the case. Yeah. It's a compound object. Move. Move is like it, it destroys the thing that you uh, that you put into it because you don't want it, you don't want it like lying around. You don't want reference to it. You want to like put it in the object. So you can, uh, do the We're getting it. You can, but it sucks, which is why I had to go through the whole spiel in the beginning of class because it's actually really disappointing. Uh, yeah, I'm good. I'll, I'll take a look at it. It is possible to Michael Jackson work stuff, but it's it's not uh, you know like turn Michael Jackson into a cougar or something. What's that? That's possible. It's highly, highly likely in two to max. What happened? Oh, uh, you did edge spaces. Should you just try it? Try it like that. Have some space. You can add a lattice.
this design is on the you probably did it. Hotkeys on there. You probably did it. Like, they added easy stuff to it, especially if you use that. It's much more like that. Step more, it's just slightly more complicated, but not by much. Okay, if you guys, if you guys are having, I see some of you guys trying to do this. So if I go in, I'm going to start with my simple uh, box, and just to just to show you guys uh, clearly, I think it's okay to be in different positions with them. I don't think it actually affects them. So I got an edit mesh, and I'm going to go in, and uh, I might just pull this, twist it, and then I've got another mesh where <clears throat> I'm going to, this is something I always like to do, you go into polygon, and you just pinch them. Let's just, let's just call those different states of the same uh, box. So I go in to the object, and I say I want a, a compound object <coughs> morph. And the first target that I'm going to do at 50 uh, in my timeline is going to be this guy, and my second target is going to be at 100, and it's going to be this guy. And so there you go. Okay? Does that make sense? So now I actually get a state that's between those two and then one that's like less cool that's over here between these two and in fact I believe I could take this key guys and I can uh, change the position of it yeah so now it becomes it pinches first and then it rotates or I could or I could have it morph from the first form to the more like banal form so cool huh the keys are just information, they're data, they're, they're, you know, like parametric information that's along the timeline. I can play with that. It would work if you modified the lattice, like make the lattice and then pull the points around in the lattice geometry. Yeah, it takes some getting used to, guys. Like, when you, you have to think about, again, you can have modifiers and, and all that stuff, but you have to have them on the object before you start doing stuff to it, okay? So can you apply that to a path? Yeah, well, not even a path, man. Check this out. Yeah, good, thank you. All right, Ryan, you're like the TA that I don't have. Um, check this out. Okay, so we're at zero, all right? I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do auto key and I'll move my object. Oh, wait, I messed that up. Um, go to 100, move my, my lame box over to here and now it's going to move it's going to moonwalk its way from cougar to michael jackson 
Okay. Yes, I'm old. Um, and then if I go through and I do snapshot, guys, I'm gonna do a range, and I'm gonna do a range of like 15 copies, and I get. Oh wait a minute, I think I messed it up. <clears throat> Should work. Snapshot. Huh. Not sure what's happening here. Oh yeah, it is. It, it's it's a. It is. It, it did actually uh, work. You can see that it's getting like taller as it goes. I, don't, I gotta. Mm, something's up with this. Take a look. What what should we what should we be getting? It should be a box by the time it finishes. This worked before. You might I might just not have enough copies or something. I don't know. From one to yeah, it's definitely yeah. That's the morph. Yep, it's working. It's just the change might not be might not be start, might not be like dramatic enough. But you can see the twist happening, and then the twist going back to the uh, to the flat box. I I have too many frames now. But so there you go, guys. You could you could do this as as a study, right, of a model like changing from one form to another. I wouldn't do too many of these, right? But it's certainly uh, it's certainly possible. Let's let's do another snapshot with maybe eight copies or something like that. I think you have to do a mesh though of each. Yeah, see that? That's happening. And then you could probably erase the the original. The spacing is a little funky. I'll grant you that. Is it because of more keyframes it doesn't start at zero? Yeah, yeah. But you can see it's pinched here, and then and then it's actually by here it's not pinched anymore, and the rotation changes. So then if I went in, you know, and I could imagine if I did like an ink and paint material or something like that. Get my series of diagrams, you know. Anyway. You could do better. You will do better. You must do better. Okay. So um, yes, combining snapshot with morph is uh, is a pretty good idea, if I do say so. Any questions about like that that process, like that that we kind of did snapshot, we did along a path. Nothing says you couldn't morph along a path, um, you know. But snapshots really it really starts to get useful. This is where it's better than than like Rhino, right? Is is that we can get these different states of an object. Uh, from one thing to another. So, so animating, you know, these objects, these like sub-object transformations, can be a way. First of all, talking about your process, like if I if I, if I want to illustrate to someone how I got somewhere, maybe I start with a box and I end up with something else. Or if you want to know what's in between two steps, it's a really useful uh, tool. Um, last thing that I want to show you before this break is blob mesh. Yes, it is as awesome as it sounds. Um, remember, we talked about the blob and Greg Lynn and the amorphous beware the blob. So you go to compound objects and you turn on the blob mesh tool and you make blob meshes. And they, they're always like uh, balls. And that's because they are intended to simulate uh, fluids. And if you know if you have like droplets of mercury, which you don't, because we shouldn't have that. But you know you've seen videos of that, or droplets of water, when they uh, touch each other, they kind of ooze together, right? And if you have a big droplet, it's going to absorb little droplets, and so on and so forth, right? So that's what these are. These are a simulation, a rough, uh, a crude simulation of uh, fluids. And so they start; they're always droplets, but you can adjust their sizes. Right by by pulling uh, on them with the uh, scale tool, so I've got a pretty happy collection of, of uh, blobs, and each blob mesh has uh, you can actually pr you can you can change their size like parametrically. They have a tension, which is the likelihood that they are going to break and then absorb themselves into another like object. Okay, and there's all this other stuff here. Okay, one of your blobs is like king blob or queen blob. And it will uh, be the, the source one. So let's just, and you can, you can change the names of things. I'm going to go ahead and call this one King Blob so I know which is which. 
And these other ones are blob 3, blob 4, blob 1. Okay, so I know what they are. This is important because once this calculation starts, you might lose them. I'm going to go ahead and uh, add these other blob objects to the blob. Wow, and the tension must have been must have been pretty messed up there. Anyway, so you go into the blob, and you can... Um, they're still in there. In fact, if I go into the wireframe here, I can grab that and now watch so as I as I pull that it's actually pulling these other uh, pieces apart I think I just made it messed up a setting in there but anyway you can see them kind of you know oozing together in pseudo real time you see they kind of stick together and again I think it's because I I set something up in the initial parameter uh, that was wrong maybe the size of it is too too big yeah, if I reduce the size of these a bit. So anyway, you can kind of play with these. You can you can you can rotate them. You can the more of them you have, the more resolution you have. But these this is computationally very intensive. Um, that's what these evaluation coarsenesses are. So you can you can evaluate. You can change the coarseness of it. So if it's less coarse, you're going to see more detail, but it's also going to slow it down. If it's more coarse, it's going to have like far less detail. But at render time. So I might viewport it at 10, but I might render it at 3, or I might render it at 2. That doesn't change anything, right? But when I render it, it's going to calculate it at uh, level 2. And it's going to get smoother and smoother. Okay, so you see that's actually, they're like Girl Scout cookies that melted together, or something like that. So uh, um, blob meshes, you can experiment with them a little bit more, but, you know, I've seen studies of things where, like, each blob represents a kind of program, and they have a certain, like, threshold, right? And then uh, they can create the circulation of a building. Let's say that you, you distribute these blobs um, all throughout a park, and there are places where there aren't blobs and places where there are because of trees or because of other things, and then you, like, turn them all on, and they all ooze together, and that creates a kind of form of that park that you can then carve up. Okay, so these blob meshes are a way of taking like disparate elements in your in your designs, and essentially considering what would happen uh, if they were fluid. Okay, um, yes, you can put these on a path, and they will do all this stuff. Yes, you can do all that stuff. So that's another interesting thing too. Put three blobs on like paths that intersect at certain points with different tensions, and then run the animation. And at certain points, they'll ooze together and create a form, and then they'll like break apart. When do you stop it? That's up to you, right? You're the designer. Okay. Cut the bottom of it off. It's a. It becomes like a canopy. Cut the top of it off. It's a skate park, right? So anyway, it's kind of an interesting topological uh, form. Uh, you can you can always you know um, you can always play with the settings. It might be a little bit unintuitive at first, but it's something neat. I don't know. It's it's something that I uh, hadn't really encountered before I got into uh, like animation programs. Rhino uh, has something like it, but it's not this, this like fluid. You can't really animate it. Oh, yes, you can animate it, right? That's what I was just talking about. Look at that tension there. So you can find a point at which maybe they can all kind of talk to each other. They can all get along. I don't know. Anyway, so play with those for a bit. They're lots of fun. If you go, if you have the one true mesh, you know, you, you have the one object, you just say pick, and then you click on all the meshes you want to add to it. Otherwise, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't know how to calculate the mesh. You can break it down. You could have two blob meshes that don't interact with each other, right? That are just, that are just touching, that are taking from other blobs. You really got to experiment. I mean, there's no other, there's really no other way to, um, you know, to, uh, to really, like, understand how it works. It's just that's the thing about Studio Max in general. There's just too many settings. Let me um, let me craft. Whoa. Let me try to craft a mesh here. So if you if you pull some of these together, you've got this blob mesh here. I can. Let me. Uh, you gross. Tension does kind of weird things. I don't quite like. Wow, that's like a Mon Calamari cruiser. Okay. And then you go in and you can go to edit mesh. 
and then you know you can do anything you want to it. Like I can start to, like I said, I can start to cut. Oops. And cut parts of it off if I want to. So those are the old pieces, but on the inside I've got this like surface. Oh my gosh! Call the Guggenheim. If I go in, let's do realistic shadows. Yeah, and then if I go in, I can add a. Uh, uh, shell to it. Crunch. Build that. That's ridiculously easy. So you know it's got like thickness. That's just that's crazy. Yeah, your your professors are not gonna be happy. We'll play with that for a minute. Uh, let's, you can take a break till uh, 4 o'clock. We'll come back. We'll finish this off with particle systems and physics simulation. Yeah, Nick. Yeah.